Did it work? Ellen, you're there. We did it. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Of course. <laughs> we did the first part right. We got the technology to work. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> So as I said, I am the assistant principal librarian since 2010, and Ellen is currently our third horn player. She's been with the orchestra since 1993. Thanks for joining me, Ellen. Um, we are here to chat about our newest recording of Mahler's Seventh Symphony. Um, it is available on Spotify and Apple Music, and you can also buy the CD at the Minnesota Orchestra website. Um, Ellen, do you want to talk about how um, there are special horn, what kinds of special horn solos or horn section features are there in Mahler 7? Mahler 7 is a very special piece for the horn. Of course, Mahler loved the horn in general. Mm -hmm. But um, his, the first movement that he actually wrote was the Nacht music uh, movements. And that, um, particularly the second movement, opens with two horn calls. The first horn is playing open and the second horn is muted. So the first horn is Michael Gast and I, I return the call. And it harkens back to Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique where the opening of that piece, uh, one of the movements has the oboe and then the English horn off stage kind of calling back and forth. So he intentionally did this to give you that feeling of being outdoors. Mm -hmm. One of the, it's so much fun to play, but one of the really cool things is about halfway through the movement, it comes back again um, and extends that wonderful duet with cowbells that are off stage. So it gives you, really gives you that outdoor feeling. Um, it's really a magical sound. So I love doing it. I think so too. Um, do you have any special memories from this particular recording? I know it's been a while and we've all been distorted in terms of time because of COVID. But is there anything um, about that recording session that comes to mind or just um, how horn players kind of um, use their faces and their bodies to make sure that you can, you know, stay fresh through a whole week of recording sessions? That's a really good question because especially for a, a brass player, recording a Mahler symphony is like running an ultra marathon you really don't get a chance to take a break. You don't know which take they're going to say, that's the one we're going to take. So every take you have to make feel like it's the most spontaneous moment, even though you might've done it a few times and you might not be as fresh as you felt like you were when you did it at 10 in the morning when you're doing it at 3.30. So um, a lot of that is preparation and uh, there's a lot of technical things you can do as a horn player to prepare for, for that kind of thing. But um, certainly it wouldn't be something that um, I would recommend someone do uh, go. In other words, I wouldn't recommend someone go and just play through a Mahler symphony 10 times in one day, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> basically what we were doing. So um, yeah. So I would say uh, I talked to my colleague, Mike Gast, about how he felt about doing this. And he said it's, it, it is, it's like a physical endurance test. And, but mental too, because Osmo is up there giving us, uh, trying to get right back into the feel and the rhythm of it. But we have to come up with that quality of sound that we're looking for to create. And I think between us, um, um, Michael and I have worked together for so long. We almost we almost can breathe together without even having someone there. But um, having that moment magically happen with our colleagues around us, and, and you know, enveloped in the sound, cr it created something really special. Yeah, I was thinking about the the kind of collaborative process. You know, the musicians on stage have to, like you said, stay fresh, even if it's the sixth time we've gone through a section. And then Osmo is going to have his ideas that come along in the moment. And then also our wonderful colleagues um, through BIS, um, they have very good ears and, um, you know, create something really incredible, but they have their own opinions as well, which I think maybe some people forget um, that it's not like they just sit there and, you know, take it all down and, and leave. They um, they're very good at um, shaping it into the final project or product. 
I think why that's so interesting is because um, what we do is we're playing for that larger hall, but what they know, what they do when they're recording is the mics are closer to us. So mm -hmm. I, you know, they have to make the sound fit what we're doing. And sometimes yeah. that can, those two things can be in opposition from, you know, to mm -hmm. one. And so I really, Rob has amazing ears and it's so amazing to have him, you know, his little voice come out and say something You're like, oh yeah, okay. You yeah. Know? And then you go back and listen and your mind is just, you know, it's like it opens it in a whole new way. And it really is different than just playing for the hall. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was a student at Juilliard and I lived in New York for a year, um, going to orchestra concerts and being amazed at how different orchestras sound live than when they're recorded. Sure. And one of the things I love about our recordings is I feel like I'm sitting in the hall listening to the orchestra. Mm -hmm. because they're really authentic. And I really yeah. think he does a fabulous job of making that happen. Yeah, I was listening to it over the past couple of days. Um, and I totally agree with you. It felt it feels very, um, it has a lot of vitality um, that does approximate like hearing it live. I just the clarity and it felt really, it still felt really just full of all those characters that are in Mahler 7 that I think make it such a unique piece even out of the amazing Mahler symphonies. Um, what is your favorite Mahler symphony? Oh, that's so hard. You I know. Ask me that question. <laughs> oh, well, during this incredible time of COVID, I've been looking at nine and three quite a bit. And nine just pulls at me all the time. It, it pulls at me. It's just yeah. amazing. It's such an amazing piece. So I, I can't wait to do that one. I'm really looking forward to it. Of course, three has amazing memories for me. I was sitting on stage with David Zinman conducting and I went into preterm labor with my second child. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so that's <laughs> memories with- Please excuse me. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was kind of a big memory. So maybe that's another reason it's not my favorite. I don't know. <laughs> that's really funny. Nine is my favorite as well. Um, I think that every time I've performed it, it just like gets better and better. Um, although I do think like seven is up there because it's um, the emotional extremes are to me seem even more so than we're already used to in Mahler. Um, and like he plays with form and he uses these interesting instruments like the, the cowbells and the guitar and the mandolin. It makes it very charming, don't you think? Oh, that movement where Aaron comes in at the beginning and yeah. then you have the the mandolin and the guitar it's just so intimate it's one of my very big thoughts yeah and even even using full sections like he uses it's almost like he creates little music groups within mm -hmm. the orchestra um so it can feel very small and intimate and then just explodes with you know whatever feeling he has next which we know he had many feelings <laughs> True. I mean, it, if you listen to knock music, you of course you hear the horn calls, but then you hear the forest calls after that, and then you start to get a little bit of sense of like, oh, oh, something's coming because there's these trumpet fanfares. Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, out of that emerges the most beautiful hymn, and I feel like today we could all use that hymn, and it's like people are calling out when you hear it. Mm -hmm. It's a prayer for mankind. And so for me, that movement is incredibly special and not just because of the horn calls. It just has a little bit of everything in its voice that speaks to where we are today. Yeah, and I think, I think in general, Mahler as a composer could be a place for people to find some refuge right now because, you know, he did put so much of like his personal self into music and he thought, you know, I think he thought a lot of um, about mankind and whether that was from like a spiritual aspect or humanity that shows up you know it really not just in the symphonies but throughout the symphonies um, almost all of them I think have some aspect of that yeah it was yeah. personal to him too like I read about when he was <laughs> when he was expecting the premiere of this when he was physically ill 
Mm. He was so nervous about it. And to think that someone like Mahler, who, when you hear his music, you're thinking he must be the most grandiose, verbose person in the world, was physically ill at the thought of this piece being played and him being criticized. He left himself open to people. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to do the same, to leave ourselves open to ideas and people and um, create a mood of um, an opportunity for the world to come together, which I feel like his music totally speaks to. So Absolutely. Yeah, I was also reading about the premiere. And um, yeah, he was terribly nervous. And this piece really only got kind of moderate you know, reviews. It wasn't, it wasn't panned, but it wasn't super celebrated either. Um, but I also read that it's his um, favorite. It was his self-declared best work. Um, and I wondered if maybe later, you know, Sternberg later really championed this piece. And so maybe that helped shift into what we know now. Um, you know, if you can't, sorry, just moving. Um, <laughs> So that it got played more because I think at first it was pretty um people didn't really play it a lot yeah well technically yeah. it's incredibly difficult too for instance the opening where you have the tenor horn solo yeah. that solo is so difficult and most people will play that on a baritone horn which gives it a totally different sound than what Doug Wright did when he played it on a tenor horn yeah. so he took a real chance. A tenor horn, tenor horn is a conical instrument, more like a French horn. It's more bridging the gap between the horn sound and the tuba sound, which is diff different than a cylindrical sound like a trumpet or a trombone. Not that one is better than the other, they're just different sounds. Mm -hmm. a conical instrument is often known to be more difficult to play because the partials between them can be so treacherous. Mm. Because not a clear definition of the partials. Sometimes the partials can be right next to each other. And it's super easy to bend the partials from one to another. And so um, he was given the opportunity to play this instrument. Someone sent it to him and I think he thought, well, let's see if I can do this. And oh my gosh, did he ever do it? So I can do anything. Oh, <laughs> of course, he comes us, up to us later and says, I don't know how you guys play that. And we're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. It was so amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. It was a really fabulous, fabulous yes. job. And, it, and the sound is so different. It's so worth it. So people should really listen to the opening tenor call on different recordings because I think they'll discover how wonderful Doug Doug's chance taking <laughs> was. Yeah. No, that's a really great. That's a great suggestion. And just to kind of hear the different color. Um, yeah, and how it might change your opinion or interpretation of the piece. Right. That's a great idea. Yeah. Does anybody out there have any questions? Or does Alan have any questions? Let's see if we get any questions. I feel like most people are just saying hi. Yeah, and you know what? <laughs> people don't have questions. I have a couple other things that I really noticed listening. Which yeah, is, please share. It's fun for me because when I'm actually performing, I'm sitting in the middle of a lot of horn sound. And I sit right in front of the percussion, which is amazing. The opening, the last movement, you know, the mm -hmm. Eric just wailing away on his first recording. By the way, our new timpanist is an amazing addition to the Minnesota Orchestra. His personality and musicality just immediately added to us. And I just, yeah. from the beginning, the moment he sat down in that chair, I was just like latching on to his rhythm. It's just amazing. Um, but anyway, what was I going to say about the Oh, the colors that <laughs> I hear, that I don't get to hear sitting where I sit from the front of the orchestra and the bass section, because they're pretty far from me at this point, And I've got so much, so much sound going on around me and the violin section, the violas, I mean, the cellos, oh, it's so amazing for me. So it's, it's a joyful experience to listen to when I don't get to hear it. And then there are some times that I'm so busy concentrating on what I'm doing, um, the technically speaking. Um, for instance, the last moment, there's just so much going on in the opening of the last moment that when I listened to it, the recording and I realized that, you know, that first of all, you've got that bombastic opening, but then you have these soaring calls of the trumpets yeah. one over the other until you get to Manny's big one. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, 
<laughs> you're taken into another realm of possibility and then all the trumpets begin doing it yeah. so yeah it's a, it's an amazing moment that i didn't get to share the same way because at the same time i'm blowing my guts out <laughs> like as i can and uh you know and, and trying to lay into the sound of the section in the middle of it and um yeah super fun to hear that yeah it's a totally different experience i i'm sure that every person in the orchestra would feel differently you know as they listen to the recording because you get so um tied to what you're doing yeah um yeah I love, yeah, I love Mahler 7 also because there's a lot of juicy viola moments. Yeah, um, so really are. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, I did want to share a few of my nerdy librarian things okay. about Mahler 7. Um, <laughs> one thing is that if people are interested in reading a whole lot about the source material, um, because this was a, crit a new critical edition that we recorded that came out in 2012, the score that's available from Boozy and Hawks that anybody can buy um, has a really like substantial forward where you can read all of the kind of historical things and what got changed and why. Um, so if that kind of thing is interesting to you, you can pick up that score um, from Boozy and Hawks. And we have a question. What do you enjoy in the recording process that is different than live performing? What do you say, Ellen? What do I enjoy? During recording, that's different than when we're playing live. It, that's interesting because I think uh, when you're playing it live, you never get a chance to go and hear yourself at, on, on a take or two. So right. for instance, whenever we first start recording, as soon as we have our first break, everyone is in the room listening. Mm -hmm. So we all get to hear what happened immediately, which as orchestral musicians, we don't always get that immediate feedback. Right. And a lot of what we do just vanishes into thin air. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. some of my best moments are out there somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're just gone. You know, that makes me wish I was yep. when I when I think of it that way. <laughs> but the truth is, one of the, yeah. the most enjoyable things about recording is that you can get some instant feed feedback. And mm -hmm. um, and you get another chance sometimes to go and do it a little differently, or sometimes you think, oh, maybe I could bring that note out in a different way, because yeah. the way the mics are picking it up, I'm not getting what I want, what I thought it was getting in the hall. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, any other questions? Be brave, listeners. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I also wanted to share the, or I actually wanted to ask Ellen, did you like that your parts were engraved this time instead of the ugly old handwritten parts that we had? I loved the new parts. I am a part <laughs> nerd. I love I keep all yep. the copies of all my parts and now I love it that mm -hmm. I can get gifts from the library and some of, of some parts. So I just love the, I love the real, yeah, the real paper that has the, yeah. The, it was a substantial improvement over the parts that we had. The last time we had played Color 7 was in 2010. Um, so that was the old edition, and they were pretty crappy. Yes, so. they, were. <laughs> they were. It's amazing to see when it improves like that. You're like, yay. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, as I said, you can get our new recording on um, the Minnesota Orchestra website um, for CD. And you can listen to it on Spotify and Apple Music. Ellen, do you have any closing thoughts? I think the best way to listen to this is sit out on your deck with a nice glass of wine. Put on your head, headphones, because I think even that big song will get in the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and give yourself a moment in this crazy time to enjoy some beautiful sounds. And let the sounds bring you to where they will. Absolutely. I don't, couldn't agree more. Yeah. Don't let someone else tell you what to think about them, I think is what is important. Yeah. It will, it will speak to you in a very, um, I think, a very kind of spiritual way. I totally agree. I was really, I was really affected by listening to it um, again recently. So great. Well, it was nice to see you, Alan. It's been a long time. I know. Great to see you too.
See you in a few weeks, I hope. And thank all you right. all for listening. Right. Enjoy the recording, everyone. Bye. Bye.